fingers and toes. I'm more concentrating on the fingers. Uh, they have already figured out toes as feet are necessary for normal everyday activities. Um, 500,000 people in the United States in 2005 lost either fingers or hands, and 41,000 lost an arm either above or below the elbow. So obviously this is a very large difference between the loss of hands and the loss of arms, uh, which is what I plan to address. So current technology is addressing the problem of lost arms, uh, similar to what happened to Luke Skywalker, uh, Darth Vader, or whatever happened, cut off his arm, you know, he gets a prosthetic, looks exactly like his old arm, functions exactly like his hand. Current technology here may be trying, but has not succeeded to do so. This is one try, uh, made by Dean Kamen, uh, funded by the Defense Agency of the United States, DARPA. Um, as you can see, it's made to attach either below or above the elbow. Um, one quote from an article about this was, they had to fold the electronics boards inside it into tiny little origami shapes so that they could fit all the electronics and cram them in there, and they were all fighting for space, which I believe is a little bit unnecessary. This is the Stark hand, which is purely mechanical. There's no electronics involved. Uh, this piece down here fits over the stump. Uh, it's got a cable that goes along the back of it, attaches to the shoulder. Uh, they shrug their shoulder. This one is voluntary opening, so it will open when you shrug your shoulder, pull on a cable, um, and it has springs in each hinge to pull it closed around whatever object you're trying to pick up. This is the Shadow Dexter's hand, which is not a prosthetic, but it's the current leading technology uh, for any type of moving appendage. Um, these little pieces underneath it are actually the air muscles that it uses. Each one is attached to a cable. It's got a balloon inside. When you inflate the balloon, it will pull the ends closer together, therefore pulling on the cable and moving a finger or a digit or the thumb, whatever you want to talk about. So my problem is I have a friend who blew off three fingers. This one lost two more fingers. <laughs> they are actually right here. So he has his pinky and his fourth finger, missing the thumb, first finger, and middle finger. Uh, as you can all imagine, try picking up something without a thumb. It's not really going to work at all. Uh, he's managed to adapt and can actually pick up objects and throw a baseball, which I found quite impressive. So, on the topic of hands, for me, this is a comparison of what primate hands and the homo sapien hands or human hands look like. Uh, the chimpanzee is actually our closest relative and has a thumb that's set much lower down on the hand. The pads here go straight across rather than the human hand, which has a curve, so that our finger is actually folding to a central point on the hand and provides a diagonal type. Okay, so this is a diagonal type grip. So our, fold, our fingers fold over, the thumb comes over, as compared to the chimpanzee, which hooks, and the thumb pretty much does nothing. It can't hold on to anything. Uh, Dr. Napier, sometime during the 1800s, came up with a theory about the human grips and how they evolved from our primate ancestors. Uh, the one on the left here is a precision grip made for picking up small objects. You need finite movements. Uh, it's actually was um, for throwing, so picking up a round object, a rock, something, and throwing it at a target. The one on the right is, it evolved from uh, using tools and using weapons, such as clubs. Um, the chimpanzee hand, because its thumb is so low down and its fingers are hooks, as soon as it tries to swing a tool, <coughs> the thumb lets go and it drops it. So chimpanzees are extremely ineffective, whereas our hands, have evolved so that we can hold on to tools. Uh, this is the island digit. I actually went down to Lebanon, New Hampshire with a little prosthetics 
and I talked to a man named David Loney, who designs his own prosthetics for his company. And he took one look at this and said, pretty much it's horrible. Uh, it looks cool, and I'm sure it functions well. Um, it doesn't, the fingers do not go to a central point on the hand as they would interfere with each other. Um, this one, the fingers would break pretty quickly. And one thing that the patients like to say is they, even though they're missing the fingers, they like to be able to feel what they're trying to pick up, where this obviously covers the whole hand, and they wouldn't be able to have any interaction with, with what they are actually trying to do. This here is the X finger, um, most commonly made for people who have the remaining stump of the finger. Um, this one is obviously for a uh, person missing just the first four fingers. Uh, they do have ones that are for the entire hand. They can cost, I think, somewhere up to $12,000, which in the prosthetics world is not much. Uh, so my choices were I either go mechanical or I go electronics. Electronics are extremely expensive, so I opted for going mechanical, which I have the tools and the ability to make. So electrical pros and cons. Um, electrical prosthetics uh, can function each finger individually, which going off the evolution of the human hand, we've learned how to pick up an object with our entire hand. We don't often use two or three fingers. It's, it's our entire hand. So having a functioning prosthetic that moves one finger for, say, typing is very ineffective often, uh, and uh, patients do not like it. The pro that mechanical prosthetics offer most is the comfort, because it actually sits away from the stump and doesn't rest on it. No chafing. Uh, it's actually um, called suspended. So it provides a lot more comfort for the patient. Mechanical pros and cons. Unlike electrical, these can be used in any environment. They can be used in rain, uh, snow, dust. Uh, they are impact resistant, whereas electronics, quite often you hit the side of the finger, they break. You, they break quite often. Uh, mechanical prosthetics are easily repairable, whereas electrical are not. Um, so the bottom left here is the design that I most like. It's actually made by uh, an inventor out of France. <coughs> uh, the top left is an invention by Mark Stark. Uh, the top right is what I made, and the bottom right is by Daniel Didrick, who I was in contact with. Um, another thing about mechanical is they actually provide superior grip strength due to human body and they provide ease of use where they become more intuitive whereas you know we use our hands we use our feel we use our sight to pick up something and we know where it is whereas the electronics you're missing so much of your uh, your appendage then you go to try and pick up something you can't feel what's happening there's no resistance that you personally can respond to change what you're doing. These do provide that. So this was a very helpful idea to me. Uh, this is the, a hook, which is the most common, common application. Uh, it's operated by a, a pulley. It's got a lever sitting right here, sticking this way. And when the, cap when the shoulder is flexed, the cable pulls out, pulls the lever, hook opens. Um, I use that in my idea, which is actually right here. So it opens, you pull the cable, it closes. Extremely simple, effective, may not look amazing, but it works. <coughs> um, I originally was opting for something like this, but that takes a lot more skill at welding than I currently have. Um, this one kind of is a little lumpy around the weld. Uh, so this was my solution. And this is a picture a few days ago. Um, I actually had to make quite a few modifications to how it's going to close because the cable I was using was way too thick. This one is like 0.9 millimeters, I think, and that one is 1.6, which provides a lot more resistance trying to go around tight corners and is a lot thicker cable. Um, 
I was actually told by um, Mr. Loney, who designs his own prosthetics, I was going in the exact right direction, um, using my ideas for how to pull it, and for using bicycle cable. I actually obtained this much thinner bicycle cable from him. And I have a nice bag of tricks over there that he just, you know, walking around his shop, here, you can have this, you can have this. You know, he's trying to pass everything off on me. I look at his tech and, you know, text, come on, stop giving him stuff. We need this. <laughs> so this is a picture, so a few pictures of it uh, a few days ago before I actually had it functioning. And so my desired outcome is to have a functional prosthetic for my friend so that he can do what he would have been able to. Um, normally, if he had a full hand. Um, eventually, I was hoping to go into engineering for a, a career, and I would like to make this much wider project so it can help the 500,000 people that have very few options. Um, so, any questions? don't know that yet. Um, pretty much as much as he can hold with his pinky. Um, yeah. Mm. Which, uh, can you can you put it on and explain exactly how it's going to work, please? Oh, okay. um, it actually goes over the hand just like this. I'm currently trying to get him into my house so I can finish this. Uh, what's going to happen is I have a little sheath that goes over his pinky. It's going to attach to this loop here, and when he closes his pinky, it will pull out the, uh, the cable, which will close this. I need to put bungee cord on the back of it to keep it open until he wants it closed. Um, it's simple, effective, um, not aesthetically pleasing, but there's a few modifications I have yet to Saying you need to make modifications. I'd be pretty proud of that, man. <laughs> I can't do that. I, I am pretty proud of it, but there's yeah. still a lot of work to do. This is just a prototype. And if anybody here is an engineer uh, or took Dr. Partial's STEM classes, uh, there's the, the whole 12 steps. You make something, and then you have to go back and redo it until it actually works the way you want it to. Um, this isn't quite working the way I want it to. It still has a lot of resistance.
mistakes that I've made probably took about 40 to 50, maybe 60 hours. So in total, I'd say anywhere from you know 60 to 100 hours. I haven't really kept track. Any others? Has John tried it? You ask him for like did he ask you for doing this for him or um, how was it? No. Uh, I, I played baseball with him for quite a few years and you know I've watched him struggle trying to swing a bat, trying to throw a baseball. And uh, it's always bothered me a little bit that he wasn't able to. And so my mother actually told me I should do this. <laughs> um, I was trying to find a, a capstone project and I like this kind of thing. Hey, you know John, why don't you try and do that? Oh, that's a very good idea. Was, he, well. was he actually able to hold anything with it? Um, yeah, actually. We had to keep the thumb closed with our hands, but um, right now the, the thumb hasn't bent over enough and is too long, so his pinky touches about here instead of the tip, which is what I was aiming for. Um, yeah, I still have to put uh, grip on it, too. What is it? Uh, what's, it what's it made out of? This is actually a filler rod from the welding lab. It's a steel coat, or copper coated steel that you use for just normal welding. Is, is, <laughs> is there anything that you use anything else, or the way heaviness, <laughs> lightness, you know? I tried plain old solid copper wire and I tried to solder it together but after about two full days like you know good 10 hour days sitting at home trying to get one joint soldered it didn't quite turn out well so I decided to try welding upon which my parents were you know um, don't give up yet don't give up yet keep trying you know put another couple days into this I just said uh uh so I went and got some uh, filler rod and took it home, uh, put it in my vice grips and bent it, which, this is extremely hard to bend. <laughs> I, will, I will give it that. So it's, it's a lot stronger than I was hoping it would be. So, yeah. I suspect that you grossly underestimate the amount of time you spent on it. Yeah. yeah. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> last three days. And of course having my niece just home, you know, crying all the time. So no. uh, How did you prepare to, to fit this to his hand? Um, first thing I did, which apparently I found out was the correct thing to do, was I made a mold. I went online, um, looked up, you know, Hollywood procedures for that, uh, bought gel online, he just mix it up, takes, you know, two minutes for it to start to get a little hard, stick the hand in there, and it'll solidify, and it's very interesting seeing him trying to pull his hands out, both of them, because I, I also have his other hand in a mold, and uh, so then you mix up another bag of cement plaster type thing, uh, little bit stronger than plaster, not as strong as cement. Um, dump it in there, wait overnight, and it hardens. And I was told that the prosthetics places, before they actually try and fit anything, make a mold out of the same exact thing that I use. So I guess I headed in the right direction right off the bat, and I'm very thankful for that, or else it would have been a lot more hours. <laughs> 